Hello, this is John Gill. Um, finish documenting um, all this information regarding um, the, the uh, setup and baiting attempts and, and other um, contact we had with undercover law enforcement officers in Harnett County. There were, there were more than seven of them, at least seven of them. Um, but one thing I wanted to go over in a little more detail was this Fayetteville Pact article, because this Fayetteville Pact, that is a fake organization. That This is... Um, this was um, a disinformation attempt, is what it was. The, this is this is un undercover law enforcement, or undercover law enforcement, or possibly something else. But um, I wanted to go over this article in a little a little bit. I I never really did dissect it. I did mention, you know, the fact that it was an undercover disinformation attempt. I mean, they do tell our story in here, I mean, pretty accurately, yeah, but. They, there's a lot of information here that's, well, that's disinformation, that's misleading or untrue or just totally false or half-truth. I'll go over it and we'll, and we'll, we'll pick it apart. Um, and now I, and now this is run by, by supposedly someone named Kathy Greggs or Greggs Kathy. That's got to be under, probably more undercover law enforcement. I remember the, um, the, the individual that they had call me was posing as a reporter named Stacy Borello. And I have the entire conversation or the entire interview with Stacy Borello recorded where she was posing as a reporter. Um, just told her our story is all I did. I have it posted publicly. I mean, the only ones who committed any crimes were their deputies. So, I mean, <laughs> there's not really anything to hide on my part here. So, I mean, all I'm doing is reporting the crimes committed by their deputies. But so we'll go over the deputy. The, I'm sorry, we'll go over the article here in detail. All right, Harnett County deputies beat and tasered disabled veteran and threatened his wife. That is true. Um, yeah, that part's true. They they didn't they did more. They threatened my wife. They uh, that's they assaulted her too. Actually, they assaulted her as well. Hey, hun, what was it that Kihakis did to you again, hun? One hand, he got, I'm sorry, one hand, he got gun to my temple, and one hand, he got my husband eye for him, say, if you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to kick your ass too. While he's holding gun to my temple, he can lead every little thing my husband eye for He was holding it right to the side of your head. Yes, it really, really close. What's it's that? Really, really close. It's just like this. He was holding it right to the side of your head. Yes. So he not only threatened you, he held a gun to your head. Okay, so let's go ahead and read this article. Okay. John Gill and his wife, Warren Gill, were cruelly assaulted by Harnett County Sheriff's Office deputies in their home on September 25th, 2014. That is true. To this day, the Gills have no justice for John Bing. That's true. Have, to this day, the Gills have no justice um, for John being punched in the face, kicked by multiple deputies while lying on the floor. And... While while laying on the floor and for his ill wife, who had just been released from the hospital, being cursed at and threatened with violence and, and, and had a gun held to her head as well. In addition, the Gills have no recourse to obtain justice as the Harnett County Sheriff's Office, the Harnett County District Attorney, the State Bureau of Investigation and the Governor's Office ha has ignored the Gills and Zayton Law Firm, which initially showed interest in the Gills case, has Refused to return their call since 2016. Well, that's um, not entirely accurate either. Here, let me go over. Um, like, for example, here's Matthew Ballou's email to me from 2016. You know, clearly showing. Well, they were clearly supposed to be representing us. There's no doubt about it. Just, I mean, look, look at this email. I mean, Jesse Jones didn't start taking an interest in what happened to us. You see, what happened when those deputies... When they when they filed the lawsuit in 2016, we were one of their first victims, and because I was getting out of the mil because I was getting out of, out of the military at the time, and because we were violently ran out of town by Kihagis, um, we 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 uh, kind of got screwed over on this lawsuit. But read over this email here. Okay. Um. Thank you for your email response. I know you want to help. That's one of the biggest reasons we would like you to be involved with us in this case. We think we have a real chance of making a difference, and you would be an important part of that team effort. That's the truth. 
To answer your question, in all likelihood, you would not be required to come back to North Carolina to appear in person. That's what, yeah, and that's what I thought too. It's, um, in, they can do a deposition, you know, via video, but for a lawsuit. But I mean, the fact is, the fact is, the vast majority of the cases in civil litigation settle before trial. The statistics are pretty overwhelming. It's something well over 90% of cases settle without actually having to go all the way to trial. What this means for the plaintiff, the individual who brought the lawsuit, yeah, okay, get that, okay, is that they never actually have to appear in the courtroom. At most, what is required of them, of the plaintiff, is three things. Helping us, your attorneys, if we move forward, which they did move forward, um, respond to written discovery requests called inter interrogatories and requests for production of documents. We have to put down, we have to put down answers in writing and send them to the other side. Okay, I don't need to read over all that. Sitting for deposition, which can be done via video. Lastly, would we would need you to be accessible by phone and email, which I was, although they sure weren't after sending me this email. Regarding your charges here in North Carolina, I checked with Jesse. Your charges have been dismissed. Okay, dismissed with leave. Okay, he's referring to the misdemeanor the, the misdemeanor case that they made up just to cover their own asses in the first place. There's his, um, and I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but there's his, um, his, um, what do you call it again? <laughs> his, um, signature block at the bottom. And you can see that that did in fact come from Matthew Ballou from Zayton Law Firm. So, yeah, obviously, you know, and then also if you look through like some of these transcripts, like, for example, the, 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 tra the transcript on Detective Teasley, where is it? Detective Teasley, here it is. He basically testified under oath that I broke no laws, that calling to make a complaint was, is encouraged. See right here, plaintiffs. Defendants, right here, Kihagas, Klingman, John Knight, Wayne Coates, um, when he was major, actually, when I met with him, he was a captain, he was promoted to major shortly after that, Larry Rollins, and after I met with Wayne Coates in person, that's when Kihagas started parking outside our house every other day waiting for us to leave, page eight. Here, where's the part where they start talking about me? He testifies on here that calling to make a complaint is encouraged, which is all I did. I called their non-emergency line. It wasn't really even making a complaint. I was inquiring, actually. Okay, my name is in here somewhere. Um, there. Okay, it should be in here. I went to his home. They're referring to me. I went to his home to, to try. To, they were he. They were serving me with some civil process paperwork. He was. Apparently, he was one of the deputies that knocked on the door that I didn't answer for. And that's what made him so mad was I wasn't answering my door. And then I called them later to ask what they wanted. And that just made them angry. And they couldn't handle that. So they had to send Knight and Kihagas to our house to show us, you know, that they could do whatever they wanted. Anyway, um, where's the part where they mentioned my name in here? They're referring to me right here knocking at my door. Page 24, right there, page 24. Okay, 23, it's probably in here. Yep. Okay. Do you remember anything ab about your interaction with John Gill when you came to serve civil papers on him? I did not recall interaction. He he didn't come to the door. That's what they were so mad about. Well, when they, when those days when they came knocking the door, they all they did was sternly knock. And I didn't answer. But when Knight and Kihagas came to the door and Kling, when D-Squad came to the door, they, were, they weren't they were just knocking. They were, at, 
What's that, hon? They not knocking. They be beating the door and beating, beating to the window and to the front door. They beating the hell out of the window and door. Yeah, they were just making noise and shouting obscenities. See, right here he testifies, did you know that John Gill called the non-emergency number for the Harnett County Sheriff's Office about the event? Yes, I was just asking why they were knocking at the door. See, that that, that clarifies my story right there. I mean, e even the attorneys, and this is on the, the official federal deposition transcript. That's his official federal deposition. Here, read that right there. Did you know that John Gill called the, the non-emergency phone number? This is Matthew Ballou asking him the questions. You can read it on the transcript. Um, same guy who sent me the email, Matthew Ballou, is conducting the interview. That's page 25, so I remember how to get right back to it. Does it say that on here? Teasley, Detective Teasley. See, Zayton Law from Matthew Ballou and Jesse Jones, my attorney who I hired and paid. But Matthew Ballou is the one asking the questions on this particular deposition, which I believe is documented on here. Um, that should be that was page one. Yeah, that that anyway. That's um, Zayton Law from. Go back to page twenty-five. So he talks about how I called the non-emergency line. He said, no, I didn't know that he was on 911 when I was... No, I'd never called... No, he never dialed, never dialed 911, dialed their non-emergency phone number, which is 910-893-9111. I wasn't on the phone with 911, actually. It was a not. I called nine one one when deputies Knight and Kihagas were outside terrorizing us. That was the only time I ever did. Just because at that point we did have an emergency, but no, we called non-emergency, and even says right here on page twenty-five. But then when he replies, he phrases it as nine one one. But the question from Matthew Blue actually was, "Did you know that John Gill called?" The non-emergency phone number for the Harnett County Sheriff's Office about the that event when you came to serve me. Yeah, I called later to ask what they wanted, is all I was calling about. Now, where's the part where he talks about filing a complaint or calling the complaint? And Teasley testifies that that was perfectly fine. He said it, it would be encouraged, in fact. You're talking about some of the other victims like Christine Broom, Ryan Holloway, Tyrone Bethune, Wesley Adrian Wright. So as you can see, we were definitely supposed to be on the lawsuit. So that part of the, the that part of the Fayetteville Pact article, as you can see here, with you know from an official document, was disinformation. This is an official federal court document right here. And then what I'm looking for here is. Well, there's one part in here where he testifies that calling to make calling to make a complaint is not against the law. It's not harassment. And in fact, it's encouraged. So he basically testified under oath that I did nothing wrong on uh, on this same transcript. Um, let me just find that part real quick.
complaints about more com talk about more complaints about D Squad. Um, almost finished. Talk about Knight's Mixed Martial Arts, Jim. I called Fort Bragg about getting him blacklisted, too. Yeah, I never spoke with Teasley. Apparently, he might have been one of the deputies that were knocking a few days before with the civil process paperwork. Right, calling the dispatch right there. I don't know where they came up with the PTSD thing. They they're there, but where did they even get that information from? Um, okay, here it is on page eighty three. Okay, um, if a citizen feels that an officer was unprofessional or rude, it was worse than that. Well, he's not referring to Knight and Kihagas. He's just referring to the knocking. And, and that's not what I was complaining about. I was just wanting to know why they were knocking on my door because we didn't have time to answer the door because we were on, I was on my way out to taking my wife to her physical therapy appointment. You remember that time, hon, we were going to your doctor's appointments? Yeah. Before, a few days before they attacked us? And they'd be out there knocking on the door and I wouldn't answer. And there was that one deputy cook who I, who finally did serve me with it. But, and I was just a little rude to him. I, I was rude to him, actually. But still, that's no excuse to retaliate with violence and abusive yeah. process. Well, I, I wasn't really that rude to him. I just kept walking to the car. Yeah. And I wouldn't they stop and got, talk to him. They got, they got well, he, he, all he did was pin the, well, they got, he, not deputy cook. All he did was put the paperwork on my windshield. It was the night in Kihagas. Well, and that was, wasn't just about that. It was about that. And also, I guess they, they took it. When I was calling back to ask him if they, if they were, um, um, why they were knocking, they, they took that, me. They, uh, they misunderstood me as being a smart ass. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't. Okay. I, I, maybe they found it inappropriate or whatever. I mean, I was just calling to ask why they were knocking. Is that, is that a crime? No. If a citizen feels that an officer was unprofessional or rude, this, this, the citizen is a question for Matthew Blue. The citizen is allowed to call the Harnett County Sheriff's Office and make a complaint about that officer, correct? An answer from Teasley, sure. They should be able to, yes. And they can call the non-emergency line and voice that complaint, right? That, right, that's what I did. Obje and then Hartzog says, objection, you can answer if you, if you know. And he answers, and he, but he does answer. He says, yeah, they are free to call the sheriff's office for whatever they want. Oh, for anything you want. Okay. Well, I wasn't just calling, you know, for anything I wanted. I, I was calling, you know, with specific inquiries and, and also to give them information as well about that same paperwork. You know, this, the, the paperwork they were serving me with was from Maryland. And I got a letter in the mail from the court in Maryland saying that it was ruled null and void. 
and that I could disregard it. That was another reason why I called them was to tell them that. Since they served me with it, they needed to know that the paperwork was null and void, was ruled null and void by the court in Maryland. It was just some, anyway, long story. Um, so he said, yeah, they're free to call the sheriff's office for whatever they want. And part of that is making a complaint against any employee, not just the sheriff's office staff, but any employee, sheriff's office, or the county. I'm pretty sure we would all encourage that. Okay, so go back to um, Fayetteville Pact article again. Okay, so yeah, I, you know, so you see the disinformation there uh, regarding the attorneys, re regarding the crooks. I'm working on hiring a new attorney, and we we actually do. We actually um, there's plenty that can be done, but it might cost me some money unless we f are physically living in North Carolina. But, okay, the worst thing about the situation is no one will help us. We are victimized, and people treat us like it was somehow our fault. We were just in our house, and deputies attacked us. No crime was committed, Gill said. The events leading up to the assault by Harnett County deputies are as follows. John Gill is a, dis is a disabled veteran who had recently been discharged from the military. I'm a medically retired disabled veteran. I um, Yeah, I'm no different than someone who retired after 20 years. I am retired after 18 years of service, but it, yeah, um, anyway, I'm, but medically retired, permanent and total disabled veteran. Shortly before the, so I'm, yeah, I'm no different than treated. No, I have the same rights basically as someone who's retired after, after full 20. I, even though I only did 18 years, but I'm medically retired, but permanent and total. So shortly before the, the September 14, the September 2014 incident, Gill and his wife had experienced a horrible accident that caused him to be hospitalized and his wife to be on life support for months. Gill suffered a traumatic brain injury and so did my wife. As a result of the accident, it was because of really bad weather. We were coming out of the back gate of Fort Bragg, pull, pulling out of Manchester Road. And um, yeah, we got hit with a storm. I was, it was getting, I, was get, I was out processing. I was dropping off my last NCUER, and the, the, the base was closed that day because of the, the bad weather getting ready to roll in. And, well, because I was on transition leave, I didn't get the word. And we ended up getting caught in that storm, and that's what caused the accident. But um, Gil and his wife experienced a horrible accident. Okay, Gil suffered traumatic brain injury, and that wasn't my first time, you know, um, sustaining TBI. I sustained TBI previously in the military a few times. I'm a disabled veteran. I was out my at the time the accident happened. My medical retirement packet was already um, in the process, actually in the works. But in in this accident actually happened on my way back from work, and my wife happened to be in the car with me. Okay, Warren Gill required medication and regular physical therapy appointments to heal from her injuries. Right. That part's true. She was going through physical therapy at the time, you know, at the time, you know, at the in incident happened, particularly like when Kihagis was parking outside our house every other day, making it really difficult for us to get to her appointments because she was trying really hard to start another incident. You know, we were basically forcefully ran out of town. In the midst of her recovery, a Harnett County deputy came to their home with civil process paperwork regarding a past matter in Maryland. It, it, it's, it was ruled null and void. It was, it was um, a <laughs> long story, actually. Um, I'm not going to really get into it. It was um, an individual I used to work with in Japan, actually. The, our headquarters was in Washington, D.C., but um, the individual I, I used to work with was charged with, um, with uh, rape, actually, and I had knowledge of the incident, and I, I had to give information about it to CID, a long story. It's a very long story. I'm not going to get into it. And, and it, it bottom line, it it caused it ruffled some feathers when I spoke to CID about my civilian boss with that agency. And I I can't go into any further information about it actually because some of the backstory is actually classified. But th this part's not actually, but <laughs> obviously. But um. So anyway, where 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 was I? Um, okay, the, okay. Talking about the civil process paperwork, a deputy came to their home with civil process paperwork 
regarding a past matter in Maryland in a hurry and still recovering from the traumatic brain injury. Gill brushed off the deputy. That part's actually kind of, well, if you're talking about Deputy Cook, yeah, I, well, I mean, I kept walking to the car, but he still served me with it, which he thinks contributed to the assault he later suffered. And I mean, again, I didn't break the law. I mean, I, I just walk, continuing to walk to your car and refusing to talk to the police is not a crime, especially when they're not there to arrest you. Okay, not long after the, that visit, Gill received documentation from a Maryland court that the civil matter had been settled and no action was required on his part. Well, that's kind of disinformation as well. It wasn't that. It was actually, the, it was ruled as null and void. In other words, it had no standing in the first place. <laughs> so, where was I? Okay, Gill called the Harnett County Sheriff's Department to let them know the matter had been settled. Right, to let them know it was ruled null and void. That was the day they attacked us. But the person who answered the phone continually hung up on him without confirming that she had recorded the information. Gill, yeah, that's, that's true. She started gaslighting me, the dispatcher. That's what started the problem in the first place. So Gill scanned the document from the Maryland court and emailed it to the sheriff's office, hoping to resolve the issue. Well, I wasn't trying to resolve any issue. I was hoping to let them know that the paperwork was null and void. So, you know, because they served me with it. But, and there wasn't really anything to resolve. I mean, but in the middle, okay, so where was I? So uh, soon after, he tried to call the sheriff's office to report the resolution of the case. Well, it wasn't really resolution of anything. It was just... Um, letting him know that the paperwork was no good. But anyway, okay, so the deputies didn't announce or identify themselves. They circled Gill's home and, and pounded on exterior walls, doors, walls, and windows, to be more specific. Gill recalls one deputy shouting, we're going to kill you, mother effer. Yep, that's exactly what I heard. You remember that? Yeah. Um, when Gill looked out the window, he saw Deputy John C. Knight silently staring at him while pointing his Glock 9mm directly at his head. That's what, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's what it was. Um, with his finger on the trigger, Gill recalls that Knight didn't say a word and didn't ask him to open the door. Gill said, please don't shoot. And then, Yeah, okay, well, yeah, he was pointing. I went to the window and I was greeted by Knight pointing a gun at my head through the kitchen window. And my hands went up and I said, hey, please don't shoot. This is just a phone in my hand. Please don't shoot. And he just stood there silently pointing his gun at my head through the window, giving me the evil eye. So I finally ducked and I low crawled back into the living room with my wife where I stayed. Gil said, please don't shoot. Then crawled on the ground to check on his. Okay, uh, yeah, I ducked because I didn't want to get shot. <laughs> so they kind of left out that part right there. He was po he was actively pointing a gun at my head. Well, they did. With his finger in the trigger, Gil recalls that Knight didn't say a word. Yeah, they got that part right. Yeah, they did. It, I, I ducked and low crawled. Because I didn't want to get shot. He was just staring at me like a psycho, uh, pointing a, a gun at my head to the window while the rest of the deputies were still out there pounding on doors, walls, and windows and acting like complete and total freaking hooligans. Okay, next Gil heard the deputies beating the door with their hands and shutting up sanities. He started an audio recording. Yeah, I kept fumbling between audio and video, audio and video, because at first I could only, I couldn't see them. I could only hear them outside. So I turned on the audio recording first. He started an audio recording to document what was happening. I got part of it recorded, but they deleted my video. Who deleted my video, huh? What's that? I'm sorry, she was falling asleep. Say that again. Who who deleted the video? Nicholas Gihagas. Yeah. Right. Um. She's still disabled from that brain injury, but she, you you remember everything that happened, right? Yeah. How well do you remember? I I remember. I remember that Gihagas. Well, one hand, he got my husband's iPhone, and one hand, he got a gun in my temple, say, if you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to kick your ass, too. While he's doing that, he's going to leave every little thing my husband's iPhone. While he pulled a gun in my temple.
That's the he started an audio recording. Okay, so he called, and you know, all the video I had, he deleted, but he called out to the deputies asking him to please stop beating the door and telling them that he will unlock it. Yep, that's true. But they didn't stop. They kept bashing the door with their hands. They they could have kicked it in anytime they wanted, but they weren't really trying. They were just bashing the door with when they worked their way around to the living room. But they finally worked their way around to the living room and, and, and converged all on that on that one door because they knew I had low crawled back in the. They knew I went back into the living room with my wife, and they were just trying to terrorize us. That's all they were doing. They were bashing the doors, walls, and windows, shouting obscenities. They were not acting like professional law enforcement officers officers in any way, shape, or form. Gill proceeded to unlock the door, which was actually difficult, and started video recording. Yeah, I actually had the, they were bashing the door so hard I couldn't even get it unlocked. I remember I actually had to lean against the door a little bit just to unlock it because they wouldn't stop bashing it. And then as soon as I unlocked it, the door flung open, and that's when I hit video record again. After Gill unlocked the door, Deputy Knight rushed in, that's true, and used a closed fist to punch Gill in the face. That's true. Gill fell in. That's why I went ahead and kept the article, even though I know it's an undercover disinformation attempt. I went ahead and kept it anyway because it, it does get most of the story actually a little more detailed than News and Observer did, actually, but... So, but anyway, um, Gil fell to the ground and deputies Knight and Nicholas Gihagas began kicking and stomping on Gil. He pleaded with them to stop, saying he wasn't resisting. That's what that's what happened. I kept saying, hey, please stop. Stop. Please stop. I'm not resisting. Stop kicking me. Damn it. Stop. They were just beating me up for no reason whatsoever. All I did was hold up my phone to record and Knight took his closed fist and punched me in the face, and I went face down on my living room floor, and that's when they began kicking and stomping on me. They got that part right. Knight and Kihagas didn't stop assaulting him until after about a minute. Okay, Deputy Knight, Deputy Klingman was there too. I'm pretty sure I remember seeing his face standing over me when I think he was one of the ones holding the dry stun gun or the taser or whatever you call it. But Gil says he's not sure if Klingman was kicking and stomping on him because he was face down on the floor while they were beating him. Right, that's true. I couldn't see, see I, all I saw was Knight punch me, was Knight's fist, and then I, when I was laying face down, I was being kicked and stomped on by more by at least three deputies for more than a minute, or close to a minute, S several seconds to a minute. The deputies also dry tasered Gillet. I think that's what those devices were. It was some kind of taser or stun gun device. I'm not exactly, I think it's called a dry stun gun, I think. But I remember I was trying to explain that to the polygrapher, the private polygrapher who I hired. And he was, he told me, if you don't know exactly what, what it's called, then don't, don't even say the name of it. Just, just stick to what you know for sure. You know, so I, I do my best, but okay, intending to cause pain without inc incapacitating. The, the deputies left Gill with a broken with broke cracked ribs, yes. The medical records actually say bruised ribs. An injured foot, actually fractured foot, which is what the the medical records document, and a black eye. Injuries that he documented with pictures and needed treatment for at the hospital. It went to Duke Hospital. The deputies never presented a warrant to enter his home. They did not. They didn't have one. That's why they were making all that noise trying to get me to open the door. Because they knew I didn't have to. Um, after the deputies removed Gill from the house, his wife warned Gill. His wife Warren saw the deputies trying to erase evidence of the assault by deleting the video. Uh, the the deletio, by deleting the video her husband had recorded. The deputies didn't find the earlier audio recording of them shouting obscenities while outside, which Gill says he still has although it doesn't represent the full brutality of the encounter because it doesn't capture... I don't have the entire... They were out there for... But, what, how long was it, hun? Well, long, I think. Long, eight, eight, long enough to do everything. It's more than a half hour. More than a half hour. It was, I mean, but... So I didn't have the whole thing recorded, but... um, Yeah, the audio recording was on voice memos. 
as I documented on a previous video, okay? I don't need to, should I go to my phone again? I have to plug it in. I, I can go to here. I, I can go to my Facebook group real quick and show you where I previously, I, I did a pre, it's on my, it's on my, it's already on YouTube. I don't need to go to it again. I, I already documented it. Um, I, I show you where the, um, I actually show you that it's stored on, here, I'll go to that real quick. It, it was stored under audio diary, or not audio diaries, or the um, the uh, voice memos app. Here, let me go to that real quick. Scrolling down. Stand by. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go over this article in a little more detail because some of the stuff they were writing in there was a, an attempt to squeeze in little bits, little tidbits of disinformation about what happened. So, um, regarding the audio, here it is, the audio recording, is that it? No. Yeah, it's in here. Here it is, right here. John Gill. My wife and I... Right here, on, on here, see right there, on, I show on video, I, I have video documents where I show you that it says September 26th, but that's because we're in a different time zone. It's actually was September 25th, 2014. Apple... The Apple software will adjust to the time zone, but and we're ahead. So that's, you know, you can see that the audio recording is, in fact, on my voice memo or on the audio or voice memos app on the iPhone. So that that's why that, that's why they didn't find the audio recording. Let me clarify that. They're trying to, I think they're also trying to create what they could perceive as holes in the story, which there are none. <laughs> And that's what I'm doing. That's another reason why I'm going over this. The deputies didn't find the earlier audio recording of them shouting up senators outside. You can hear part on the audio recording. You can hear some of it. And I have other recordings in there. I haven't even made public yet either. But you, you can hear some of what they were doing outside. But I mean, I, I mean, I kept switching from video to audio while they were outside. And they deleted all the video that they could find, you know, right underneath the... Um, well, you go to photos, the photos app on the phone, you delete it, then you go to deleted items, and that's what Kihagas did. Okay, so when asked for when asked for the deputies, Warren asked for the deputies to give her the phone. Yeah, what did you say again, hon? I said, I said, give it to, all I asked for, my husband asked for, give it to me. And one, well, I'm sorry, one hand, he got my husband's iPhone, and one hand, he got under my temple, all I had was, give it to me. Right, and then what, what he, you, you were just asking for my phone. Yes. Deputy Kihagas replied to Warren saying, what did he say to you again, hon? He said, one hand he got my husband's iPhone, and one hand he got under my temple saying, if you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to kick your ass too. While we do that. He deleted every little thing my husband asked for. Right before the gun in my temple. So as you just heard, they got this part right right here. Deputy, as, as you just heard my wife say, Warren Gill, Deputy Kihagas replied to Warren saying, if you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to beat your ass too. Kick your ass. Kick your, well, that, well the way they phrased they won't beat. But he, yeah. said, he said, kick your ass too. Yeah. Okay, my wife corrected that. But I mean, they still got it right. They still, they still more or less got it right. This, okay, Kiegas is the same deputy who was later found to have used excessive force, excessive deadly force in the killing of John Livingston in an unrelated case. He later resigned from the Harnett County Sheriff's Office but was rehired. He committed murder is what he did. He committed murder. He shot an unarmed man inside his house at 3 a.m. without after barging in without a warrant just because he wanted to. He committed murder. She, that's actually, I think that might be a little bit of disinformation as well. Although he was, although that is true, he was later found to have used excessive force. And that's documented in, in that is a matter of federal court record. In the killing of John Livingston in an unrelated case, that was over a year later. That was within that same year between 
our incident in the killing of John Livingston, they terrorized multiple other residents who were actually named as, oh, go back to that, who were named as plaintiffs on this lawsuit right here. The, one, the, the people, these individuals you see here, these were all the people that were victimized within the same year after us. Michael Caldwell, Christine Broom, Wesley Adrian Wright, Tyrone Bethune, Ryan Holloway, and of course John Livingston was exactly a year after our case. Go back to um, Fateful Pact. Where was I? Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't. Okay, yeah. So, um, so um, he said, if you don't, so yeah. And then Kihagus is a, okay, John Livingston. He later resigned. Okay, and then now he later resigned from the Harnett County Sheriff's Office, but was rehired in Pender County. See, this is actually a pretty detailed article, except for maybe a, there might be a little bit of tidbits of disinformation they attempted to throw in there, but they actually got the story overall pretty well, pretty good for the most part, compared to what new, the, the local news media documented. Well, News and Observer did the best job. Well, I'll see, well, News and Observer left out all these details, actually, which I'll go over next. Okay, and then and that was, our story was mirrored by after News and Observer, Mandy Locke did it in 2016. Um, our story was mirrored by multiple other local news media outlets throughout the state. And well, mirrored and summarized, but not told in full detail. He later resigned from the Harnett County Sheriff's Office. Okay, um, the Pender County Sheriff, Alan Cutler, has refused to listen to Gill about the assault and harassment Kihagis inflicted on him. And I have tried calling him. I've give, since given up. Um, I even got him on the phone one time, didn't I? Mm -hmm. And did you hang up on me real quick? Yeah. yeah, he slammed the phone down real quick, yeah. After the deputies put Gil in the patrol car, Deputy Knight taunted him. Yes, he did. He said a lot. He said, Knight said, I, he said, I wish you would have come to the door with a gun so I could have shot you. His exact words were, Knight said, bitch. I wish you would have come to the door with a gun so I could have shot you. When Gill said his wife was, is on medication, you have something called Coumadin. He was just fresh out of the hospital, and she had to be observed 24-7 because it could cause problems and it could be dangerous. And I remember they, they didn't, wouldn't even send, they wouldn't even send a goddamn ambulance to my house to check on her. Somebody at the jail told me they were going to do that, but they didn't. Okay, when Gil said his wife was a medic, he required to be he required her to be supervised. Knight laughed at him and said, "If if that if if his wife died, it would be his fault." Yes, he did say that. Yes, he did. He also he also threatened to keep Gil in jail for thirty days. He did. He said, "We're gonna we're gonna jack your bond." I told him, "I'm gonna bail out of here, and I'm gonna get pictures of my medic, my injuries that you just caused, and I'm gonna go to the hospital and document it." Which is exactly what I did. But Knight told me what his plan was. It was almost like from an Austin Powers movie where the where Doctor Evil tells right before he, exactly how he's gonna kill him. You know, and you know, right, and instead of you know, you know, what I mean, but you know, it's like in the movies where the bad guy tells. You know, those corny movies where the bad guy tells the good guy, like James Bond, exactly everything he's going to do to him while he's in the trap. Or like what, or like the old Batman movie where they leave him in a trap and, and then they leave him alone or whatever. It's kind of like that. He, he, was, he told me that he, we were going to sit. He said, I'm going to talk to the magistrate. And you're gonna, he said, you're going to be in there for 30 days. He, and he asked me, where's your phone? It's at home, huh? And, and then he, that's what he told me in the car. And they set my bail at $15,000 for a simple class two misdemeanor. That part's correct. And I don't think they set my, I know they did because that night told me he did. But I bailed out anyway. Okay, the reason the deputies threatened, assaulted, and arrested Gil that day, falsely arrested, was because he, they claimed that he made harassing phone calls to the sheriff's office when he called the non-emergency number to report that his matter in Maryland court had been resolved. Well, not really resolved. There wasn't really anything to resolve. It was just paperwork somebody filed, just um, just some 
nut that didn't like the fact that I, that I, you know, I broke the code of silence and I went and spoke to CID about my boss. Um, you know, it, it was from my old unit. There was a, some, it was a long story. I'm not going to get into it, but it was my old unit, you know, someone who just wasn't happy with the fact that I had broke the code of silence and I, and I told CID everything I knew about what he was doing to that girl in Japan. It was a local, it was his local Japanese girlfriend. And my wife knew her, knew her as well. And she sent my wife an email describing all the abuse and the rape and everything. And I had to provide all that information to CID. I had no other choice or else I would have been in trouble too. You know, it's called obstruction of justice. And then, you know, also because I didn't tell Boris that they were going to search his house. They were mad about that too. They were expecting me. I remember, well, I won't mention his name. When he, when he flew to Japan and I picked him up at the airport and he's like, John, it was a high up person from the building. I won't mention the name, but he said, John, it's really important that none of us say anything that could make this worse for Boris. Mm -hmm. oh, I, should, I shouldn't have said that name either, but, or make this worse. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Basically hinting that I shouldn't talk to CID or say anything because they were trying. He said the, the commander in the building was wanted to make, wants to make all this go away. Basically, we need your help to do it, basically. Long story. That was um, or, or something that happened with my old unit. That was what the paperwork was about. But it wasn't really anything that had to be resolved. It was just some nutcase erroneously tried to file uh, some kind of... It wasn't a protective order. It was a peace order, whatever the hell that means. A peace order. And the judge in Maryland denied it. And I got a letter in the mail informing me of that, so I just called him back. And that, I think that's what made him more mad, was the fact that the judge in Maryland denied it. You know what I mean? But that was part of it, what made him more mad. But also because I called them and I had the nerve to ask them why they were knocking after I didn't answer the door for them. That was the other reason. And because I was a little bit rude to Deputy Cook when, when he actually did serve me with the paperwork. Okay, um... So, yeah, he told me my wife... Okay, anyway, I already read that part. Okay, so... Uh, had been resolved, and the person who answered the phone repeatedly hung up on him. That part is true. He also had called the same non-emergency number a few days prior, reporting the rude behavior of the deputies who came to serve him with the paperwork. Actually, I wasn't really reporting rude behavior. If I phrased it like that, that's not really correct. I wasn't really reporting anything in those, those times. I was just calling really to ask, you know, hey, they were outside pounding on my door. What's going on? What do they want? Yeah. It was just, an, it was, yeah, it was just an inquiry. It wasn't really even a complaint. And I called, and again, it was their non-emergency phone number, which is correct. Even though Gil has documentation of the injuries he suffered, from the assault. No one will help him get the accountability or justice. A few days after the assault, a lieutenant came to his house and asked him a few questions. That's true, but nothing ever came of it. Gil went to speak with to Wayne Coates, who was then a captain. That's true, too. But Coates took no action, only saying that next time you see deputies cooperate, ignoring the fact that, that the deputies attacked and assaulted him. Coates is now the Harnett County Sheriff. That's actually pretty accurate. Right there. You know, that's actually really accurate right there. That part is actually true. That, that, that part is not, you know, it's not, that's not, some of it is not sugarcoated at all. That's why, you know, why it took me a little while to realize what was going on with all this, you know, but um, Gil also tried to meet with the Harnett County District Attorney, but no one in the office would talk to him. He called the State Bureau of Investigation. Yeah, I remember we went to, at the time, Vernon Stewart was the elected DA. And Susan Matthews was working there as an assistant DA as well. She worked for Vernon Stewart as an assistant DA for 13 years before, before he stepped down and then endorsed her to run in his place. And then she got elected. But, um, yeah, when I, I saw Susan Matthews that day and she turned around and ran back into her office and closed the door real quick when she saw us. Also called the State Bureau of Investigation, which said they would not get involved at involved at the request of a Harnett County official. What they would only get involved at the request of the sheriff is what they said. So that's accurate. As well as North Kent Department of Justice, 
and the FBI, which were all dead ends. Now, the FBI is not a dead end, actually. There was a, um, they were investigating. Um, they actually were investigating. It was called off. That's probably disinformation. The FBI was heavily involved, and that's very well documented. In fact, here, let me go over here real quick and show you. Um, I, in fact, watch this video right here. This one. Follow-up overview recap. Politics is a huge reason why news media are afraid to cover these stories. This this gets into the FBI investigation. Okay, you, you listen to the recorded call I had with Jesse Jones discussing his meeting with the U.S. attorney and FBI. And as you see, it's documented in the news media that the FBI was involved. And it was not just about that one case only. See, it was definitely very well documented that that it's definitely very well documented that they are, in fact, the FBI was, in fact, involved. Only problem was the FBI was called off by Attorney General Jeff Sessions back in 2017. Um, but Jeff Sessions ain't in charge anymore. Okay, the deputies had no fear of getting in trouble, just laughed about it, yep, and thought it was okay. I, I, I know why the sheriff, I know why, I know why now the sheriff is part of it, so is the DA. There's nobody we can turn to get for help, Gil said. Well, obviously, I mean, every, it's a, it's a, yeah, it, it's Harnett County, okay, it's, um, it's small town backwoods USA, so yeah, that's, <laughs> They're all, they're, they're all part of this. It's all one big corrupt organization. After uh, About six weeks after the assault on November 11th, 2014, Deputy Kihiga started harassing the Gills. Yeah, that was shortly after I met with Wayne Coates in person. In fact, that was a few days after, if I remember right. The deputy showed up at their house and sat outside and followed them for miles in his patrol car, just inches from their bumper, Deputy Kihagas then pulled over the Gills, pulled over Gill, accusing him of driving too slow and saying that he had a suspended license when Gill's license was valid at the time. That's 100% true. Kihagas threatened Gill, saying, Every time I see you, I'm going to arrest you. I mean, that, I mean, that's not, that doesn't, I mean, obviously, that doesn't include every little, tiny little detail. I mean, he, he was parked in front, specifically, he was parked. Next door to our house, behind some bushes, in front of a church, right next door to our house. And, and as soon as I would pull out on the 24 East, heading towards Highway 87 South, heading towards Spring Lake, that's when he got right on my ass and started bumper locking me for miles on end. You remember that? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and um, yeah, every time I would switch lanes, he would switch lanes with me. It went on for miles. He was being extremely aggressive, backing up and right in pulling forward real fast like he was going to ram me, stuff like that, just to, just to terrorize us. And I remember when he pulled us over, I didn't tell Stacy Borello about the, the way he was talking to us. Remember how he was like, he was kind of talking in a low tone of voice like that. Remember that? Yeah. He pulled his, ha his hat down. Yeah, like, What's that? He, call, he pulled his hat really, really low so he can't even see. Yeah, it. his hat was pulled right above his eyebrows, wasn't yeah, it? It really, it so, so low. And he kept talking and like, he kept trying to disguise his voice, I think, because he was afraid you were going to remember him yeah. from what he said to you. That's why. It was night that I remembered the most, but you remember Kihagas the most because of why? Yeah. The whole time, I remember everything. The, the whole kind of my temple. I remember everything. What's that? I remember. Say the, that again. I remember Kihagas part kind of my temple. I remember every little thing. Okay, about six weeks. Okay, so um, I read that part of it. Because of the intimidation and harassment by Kihagas, which persisted for months, Gil and his wife missed some of the, her physical therapy appointments. That's true. Other times they woke up in the middle of the night, or, or rather very early in the morning, and drove back ro roads to avoid surveillance and escape harassment. Well, uh, surveillance detection routes. I mean, where, where we go, you know, leave it, a di you know, very, very the times that we would depart. You know, we wouldn't, you know, leave really early in the morning and then take really, a right. Really, Instead, really. I would take a right. What's that? Yeah, really, We'd leave, really early. yeah, like 3 a.m. Yeah. And take a right down Highway 24 to, and then take a left down Marks Road. 
I actually have a video that's an hour and 14 minutes where I documented, where I show you the route we drove to avoid, you know, to uh, avoid that, that SOB. The assault and harassment of John Gillen's wife is a pattern of misconduct by Harnett County deputies. Some cases include the murders of Brandon Bethay, who died in the Harnett County Jail, and John Livingston, as well as cover up of murder, cover, as well as the cover up of the murder of Kristen Griggs. That is actually really accurate, right there. Actually, see, most of the article actually liked it. Now that that was the one, Stacy Borello. I have a recorded call with her, but I think this is an undercover. Um, organization, I think. I think this is a fake organization. This is probably undercover law enforcement. I think. I'm, I, I think. Long story. So there's my date stamped pictures of my injuries right there. That was included in the paper. These date stamped. Uh, well, see, there's more. Where's the one? I'm, yeah, they're date stamped right there. There's more. Okay, there you go. That's, that was taken in the hospital. That was taken a few days later. That was taken in the hospital. Picture of my fractured foot. And the same injuries are documented on these medical records, as you see right here. Um, which By the time I bailed out of jail and checked into the hospital, it was after midnight. So it was like September 26, 2014. The next morning, by the time we checked out. Probably should have taken off my my date of birth too, but oh well. It's okay. See right here, fracture of great left toe, injury of eye, contusion, bruised ribs, it says. They, they phrased it in the hospital as cracked ribs, but it says they're bruised ribs. Bruised ribs, same injuries you see documented on my date stamp pictures. Like the fracture of the toe, injury of eye. See, fractured toe, date stamped, taken in the hospital. Injury of eye, and that one's date stamped, taken in the hospital. Taken a few days later. That one was in News and Observer right there, I believe. Yeah, one of the, yeah, these pictures were also in News and Observer. And there's an email that Matthew Blue sent me as well. Now, go here. Harnett County leaders shrug at complaints. I can show you that our story was, in fact, they left out all the details in this article. But this is News and Observer by Mandy Locke. Okay, my story was definitely documented in the real news media, okay? It was documented by the press. And this was mirrored by multiple other, it was mirrored and summarized okay, on multiple other local news media outlets throughout the state mirrored and summarized what News and Observer printed. But they just left out all the details that I just read. They didn't go into the entire story. But as you see here, it was definitely documented by the press. Okay, there's no, you know, they're, they're trying to, I think they're, I think part of what this, um, what that Fayetteville Pact article was trying to do was spread disinformation a little bit. Or um, maybe Jesse Jones trying to say, yeah, I got your uh, your story. I told him I wanted our story um, told, our, our, all the details included. Anyway, long story. But I think this was part of, um, like, for example, like Kathy Greggs. What the, in, uh, she was connected to me on Facebook. I remember suddenly she just blocks me for no reason. I remember that, too. I, that was some some other some of the other documented baiting and setup attempts I I documented previously, but yeah, but I think the the whole purpose of this article was just to get in my head and 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 make it look like you know well more, what, make make it look like um I guess people were listening, but you know I, I we have had some success. I mean, we got dubbed back in two thousand twenty one. We actually got WECT News um, to do to do an article on Kihagus. In fact, um, I could look that up real quick. Kihagus, WECT Kihagus.
What? That can't be right. May 2022. That, that, was that? What's this? Is this a new one? Is that a new article? Well, there was one in, that came out in March 2021. That's the same one, I think, is it? Is that the same one I got him to do, I think? No, that was that was a year later. This is another article I haven't even seen yet. Hmm. This is another article I haven't seen yet right here. Oh, this is a different story. That's not Kihagis, is it? Okay, no, hang on. But that, hang on, that's that's a different one. Hang on. Okay, see, like, oh, but but notice that you see my website. I googled Kihagis. Okay, now to right, take out obituary. I saw that pop up automatically. That's why I clicked on it. Okay, he's not dead. Okay, there it is right there. Is that the one? That's, that's the other one. Yes, that, that was the follow-up article they did that was kind of sucked. There's my website. Where is it? Where is that WECT article? From 2021. That's what I'm looking for. Here. It'll be on here. Click on that. Click on that link to my website. There it is. Right there. Click on that. That was the one. That was the article right there that I personally got WECT News to do. I did. I got them to do this article. This was a few months before, in March 2021, um, Mar only three months before they settled the federal lawsuit. And in, in this article, his attorney, Dan Hartzog, said how, was talking about how Nicholas Kihagis was looking forward to his trial by jury. Well, they didn't go to trial. They settled it. Basically, they pled guilty. Same equivalent to a guilty plea they in admitting guilt but i personally got wect news to do this article so we we have had some success i've spoken with the fbi again i'm we're, i'm still in contact with them um there's still things we're working on right now um we've we've gotten multiple we've, we've gotten different news outlets to do more articles i'm trying to get them to do more but there was that and um yeah, multiple other things. We have had, we have had some successes. It has, you know, definitely has not been a total failure. Only problem is, is, you know, the local elections out there are. Well, anyway, yeah, that was what we had in 2022. We had a, we had a sham election with a, with what a strongly appears to what strongly appears to have been a fake candidate. Yeah. So anyway, that's it. That's it. I think I just wanted to document um, that. Yeah, in fact, I don't, well, the thing that caught my attention, I don't really think I really, I don't know if I really even need to do this video right here. The one thing that caught my attention was was in here where it talks about how we have, well, yeah, some of it's, well, yeah, again, some of it's disinformation saying we have no, um, you know, like, for example, what I covered about the attorneys in the beginning. You know, obviously, yeah, they, you know, they were supposed to be helping. And if we had, if we had decided to live in Harnett County, instead of moving after I got out of the army, then they, they probably would have helped us more. Anyway, long story. In fact, they were supposed to. That, that's part of the reason why the, the attorneys don't want to return my calls, as it says here, is because they missed the filing deadline. And, okay, malpractice, okay, which is legal malpractice. Malpractice. They missed the, They filed it and left our names out of it, basically missing the filing deadline 
And uh, as I documented in Matthew Ballou's email, okay, they were clearly supposed to be representing us. So, um, yeah, that's why they're not, that's not, that's why they don't want to respond. You can, you know, all I want to do is communicate with them now and find out, you know, what, what we, you know, all, all I wanted to do was, was, you know, find out about our case and then, well, they missed the filing deadline, so they don't want to talk to me now. Because if if they talk to me now, that would that would require them having to explain that. That would require them having to explain the fact that they screwed up and missed the filing deadline, and they would be they would be admitting to legal malpractice if they did speak with me. So that's why I, I just wanted to clarify everything that was in that article and make sure any potential um, disinformation attempts were um, corrected. But other than that, that article was actually pretty detailed. I actually liked the article. It was more detailed than what News and Observer wrote for the most part. <laughs> so if that, if, if, I believe that was a disinformation attempt, which has backfired on them, which is probably why they deleted it off of their page. But I hyperlinked it, so I've got it saved forever. So anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching.